We are now on the second part of this course. We are now going to discuss concepts in set theory. So first, let us discuss some basic concepts on sets and subsets. A set is a well-defined collection of objects. The objects in the set are called the elements. And we use this notation, x is an element of A, to denote that x is a member of the set A. What do we mean by the word well-defined here? It only means that we can determine whether an object belongs to a set or not. So for example, if I say A is the collection of all pretty girls, this is not a set because when we say pretty girls, that is not well-defined. We cannot really say whether a girl is an element of that set. However, if we change it to the collection of all girls with height of at least 5 feet 4 inches, then that will be a set because we can definitely tell whether a girl belongs to that set or not. Here is an example of a set. We have the set S containing the elements 1, 5, the set 4, 6, and 3. This set has four elements. You have 1, 2, this is considered as an element, 3, and 4. We have 1, 4, 3, and the set 4, 6 as elements of S. These are the four elements of S, but 4 is not an element of S. We do not see a 4 here. We just have the set containing the elements 4 and 6. However, 4 is an element of the set containing 4, 6, and the set containing 4, 6 is an element of S. This is that element. You can think of sets as boxes with objects inside. So in this case, our set S, this is the box S, and it contains the elements 1, 5, 3, and we have the set 4, 6. So therefore, we will also represent it by a box. There you go. So this is a box containing a box containing the elements 4, 6, and the elements 1, 5, and 3. There are two ways of describing a set. First, we have the roster notation, wherein we just list the elements between braces and the elements are separated by commas. Take note that the order in which the elements are listed does not matter. So for example, we have the set containing 1, 2, 3. And here we have a set of all odd numbers from 1 up to 49. So if we have a lot of elements, we use the ellipsis to denote that it will continue. Sometimes it will not be easy to write sets in roster notation because we will not be able to list down all the elements. In that case, we use the set builder notation. So we write it as follows, the set of all x such that p of x is true. For example, we have the set of all x, element of the set of natural numbers, and x is less than 6. However, we write it in this more concise form. The set of all natural numbers that are less than 6. Of course, in roster notation, this is just 1, 2, 3, 4, up to 5. Let us consider the following example. Which of the following are sets? A set has to be enclosed by braces. So therefore, the answer is this one, the fourth option. The set containing the elements 1, the set containing 2, and 3. These are not sets because they are not even enclosed by braces. Next, we will discuss the universal set. The universal set is the set of all objects under consideration. Take note that membership in a set depends on the universal set. So in this case, we have the set A to be the set of all x such that x squared minus 6x equals 0. Sometimes you can just see something like this, x, but then you should know what the universal set is. If our u is the set of all real numbers, then our set A in roster notation would be the set containing 0 and 6. However, if U is just the set of all natural numbers, our A 
will just be equal to the set containing 6. So that's why it is important that you really have to know what is your universal set in your discussion. Next, let us recall the empty set. The set that contains no elements is called the empty set and it is denoted by this symbol. So for example, the set of all real numbers, which is a solution to this equation, x squared plus 1 equals 0, this is the empty set because there are no real numbers which satisfy x squared plus 1 equals 0. Next, let us discuss cardinality. For a set S, we write this notation to denote the number of elements in S. We call this the cardinal number or cardinality of S. So for example, if A is a set containing 1, 2, the cardinality of A is 2, and B is the set containing the elements 1, 2, the set 1, 2, and the empty set, we have four elements in B. We say that a set is finite if the cardinality of S is equal to n for some non-negative integer n. Otherwise, we say that it is infinite. In our future video lectures, we will be discussing more about the cardinalities of sets. Let us recall the meaning of subsets. We say that a set A is a subset of B and we write it in this way if and only if every element of A is an element of B. Take note that I have here the word if and only if because this is a definition of a subset. In symbolic form, we say that A is a subset of B whenever, so we have if and only if, every element of A is an element of B. So that means that for all X, we are right. If X is in A, then X must also be in B. Recall that we can also write this as for all X in A, X is in B. So this is the definition of A being a subset of B. If we use Venn diagrams, we have A here. All the elements of A are contained inside the set B. If A is not a subset of B, we use this notation. In symbolic form, what does it mean for A to be not a subset of B? Take note that we just have two negate this one. What is the negation of for all x in A? x is in B. The negation is there exists an x in A such that x is not in B. So using Venn diagrams, it can be something like this. So for example, this is A, this is B. There is an element in A, that's your X, but not in the set B. Let us consider the following. Suppose we have this set X. Is 7 an element or a subset of X? Is 7 an element of X? No. Because we have these elements, the set containing 6, the set containing 7, 8, and the set containing 5, 8. Is 7 a subset of X again? No. Because in the first place, for you to be a subset, you have to be a set. And 7 is not even a set. Suppose that Y is this set. Is the set containing 5 an element of Y? Yes, because this is it, the set containing 5. Is the set containing 5 a subset of Y? Yes, because of this one. This is an element, so therefore if we put that in a set, we enclose that with braces, that will be a subset of Y. Let us consider this next example. We want to find three sets A, B, and C satisfying the following conditions. Make sure that you give very simple examples so that it will not be difficult for you. Okay, let me just put some elements in A. Let's just say 1 and 2. For the first condition, we want A to be a subset of B. So therefore, all the elements of A must be in 
B. Next, we have A must be an element of C. So that means that the entire set A should be inside C. So my A is 1, 2. I will just leave A as the set 1, 2. So therefore, this is now satisfied. Next, we want C to be a subset of B. If C is a subset of B, it only means that all the elements of C must be in B. What are the elements of C so far here? We just have the set 1, 2 here. And of course, C is not the same as B. C has only one element, whereas B has three elements. So therefore, all of these are satisfied. Again, there are many possible answers here. I just showed you one particular example. The next thing that we want to do is to prove that a set is a subset of another set. If we go back to our definition here, how do we now prove that a set A is a subset of a set B? We will use this part. What does it say? We have for all x in A, x must be in B. So therefore, how will we start our proof? We start with let x be an element of A because we have the universal quantifier for all x and this is our goal. Show that x must be in B. So therefore, we have this one. When you are showing that a set is a subset of another set, you get an arbitrary element of the first set and show that it is also contained in the second set. Let us consider this example. A is a set containing 2 and negative 3, and B is a set of all real numbers such that x cubed plus 3x squared minus 4x minus 12 equals 0. Prove that A is a subset of B. Let me just write here again the definition of A being a subset. It means that for all x in A, x must be in B. However, there are only two elements in A. How do we show that this is true? We just get the elements of A and show that they are both elements of B. How do we show that something is in B? What does it mean for some for a number to be in B, it must satisfy this equation. So for our proof, there is no need to start with let x be an element of A. So we will just show that 2 and negative 3 satisfies this equation. 2 cubed plus 3 times 2 squared minus 4 times 2 minus 12 is equal to 0 and negative 3 cubed plus 3 times negative 3 squared minus 4 times negative 3 minus 12. This is also equal to 0. So what have we just shown here? We have shown that 2 and negative 3 satisfies the equation. So therefore, 2 is an element of B and negative 3 is an element of B. Hence, A must be a subset of B because the elements of A, which are 2 and negative 3, are both contained in the set B. Here's another example. Suppose that A is the set of all integers such that 4 divides x and B is a set of all integers such that 2 divides x. So let me just write this in raster notation. So this will be 0, 4, 8, 12, and so on. And then all of its negatives. So we use an ellipsis here. And of course, B is just the set of all even integers. So if we just look at them, definitely A is a subset of B. But we have to prove this formally. I will just write the definition here so that you will remember it by heart. We start with let x be an arbitrary element of A. We want to show that x is in B. In the end, we want to have 
x is in b. Now, what does it mean for x to be in a? It means that 4 divides x. Hence, there exists an integer k such that x is equal to 4k. What do we want to show? We want to show that x is in b. That is, 2 must divide x. But we can write this as 2 times 2k. Since 2k is an integer, therefore 2 divides x. And so x is an element of b. So I will now erase this because I already have my goal here. x is in b. So for our conclusion, we have that A is a subset of B. We started with X is in A and we ended up with X must be in B. Here are some results on subsets. First, for every set A, the null set is always a subset of A. We can also say that the null set is a subset of any set. The second one states that a set is always a subset of itself. Next, for any sets A, B, and C, if A is a subset of B and B is a subset of C, then A must be a subset of C. This is the transitive property of subsets. So if we draw part 3, if this is my A, A is a subset of B, this is my B, and B is a subset of C, then definitely A must be a subset of C. Number four states that if A is a subset of B, this is my A and this is my B. If A is not empty, then B must also be not empty. Of course, this is just a way to uh, imagine what is going on, but of course, this does not give us a formal proof. Let us prove the first statement. For every set A, the null set is a subset of A. What does it mean for the null set to be a subset of A? The null set is a subset of A. It means that for all X, if X is in the null set, then X must be in A. This is what it means for the null set to be a subset of A. However, if you look at this implication, this part here is always false. So therefore, this is true vacuously. Recall that when we say that something is true vacuously, it means that the hypothesis is always false. So for our proof, we just say that the statement is true vacuously since the null set does not contain any element. Next, we want to show that for every set A, A is a subset of itself. How do we prove this? Take note that we have for every A. So for our proof, we first say that let A be a set. That takes care of for every A. Next, we want to show that A is a subset of itself. So we get an arbitrary element of A. Let X be an element of A. Then, we must show that X is an element of A, which is exactly this one. So, of course, we can just say, therefore, X is in A. And so, A is a subset of A. Take note here that we use the tautology P implies P. Alright, we have X is an element of A, therefore X is an element of A. Next, let us show the third statement for any sets A, B, C. If A is a subset of B and B is a subset of C, then a is a subset of C. For our proof, we start with let A, B, and C be sets. Next, we assume our premise. 
Suppose A is a subset of B and B is a subset of C. We want to show that A is a subset of C. So therefore, we have let X be in A and show that X must be in C. Assume X is in A. We want to end up with X must be in C. We now have that X is an element of A, but we need to use our premise. A is a subset of B. If A is a subset of B, that means that all elements of A must also be in capital B. So we have this is the set A, this is X, but A is inside B. So therefore, X must also be in B. So we say since A is a subset of B, X must also be in B. Moreover, B is a subset of C. Let's say this is my C and therefore, since X is in B, X must also be in C. And this is exactly what we wanted to show. X is an element of C. So let me just write the conclusion. Therefore, we have just shown that A is a subset of C. For part 4 here, we have for any sets A and B, if A is a subset of B and A is not empty, then B is not the empty set. How do we show that a set is not empty? To show that a set is not empty, all we have to do is to show that it contains at least one element. For our proof, we have for any sets A and B, so let A and B B sets, and then our premise, suppose A is a subset of B, and A is not empty. How do we show that B is not empty? Well, if we look at our diagram again, if A is not empty, that means that there exists an X which is an element of a, and this X here will also be an element of B, which only shows that B is not empty. So we now write that as follows. Since A is not empty, there exists an X which is an element of A. And since A is a subset of B, we have that X must also be in B. Therefore, we have just shown that B contains at least one element. B must not be empty. That concludes our proof. For the last part of this video lesson, we will discuss equality of sets. Let us recall that two sets A and B are equal whenever they have exactly the same elements. So that is, for any X, X is in A if and only if X is in B. Let us recall that a biconditional is equivalent to two conditionals joined by and. We can write this as for all x, x is in A, then x is in B, and x is in B, then x is in A. We have to show two directions. What does this implication mean? For all x, x is in A, then x is in B. It only means that A is a subset of B. And this part says that all elements of B are in A. So it means that B is a subset of A. So this two conditions, A is a subset of B and B is a subset of A, is the same as A equal to B. So we now have this one. As when we are proving equality of sets, we have two parts. We need to prove that A is a subset of B and B is a subset of A. For example, let A be the set of all reals such that x squared minus 1 equals 0 and B is a set containing negative 1 and 1. Prove that A is equal to B. First, I will show that B is a subset of A because that is easier. 
How do we show that B is a subset of A? All we need to do is to show that negative 1 and 1 are solutions to this equation. So note that negative 1 squared minus 1 equals 0 and 1 squared minus 1 is equal to 0. Hence, negative 1 and 1 are solutions to the equation x squared minus 1 equals 0. Thus, B is a subset of A. Next, I will now show that A is a subset of B. We start by getting an arbitrary element of A. So we still do not know that this one has only two elements, negative 1 and 1. So therefore, we will start with the standard way of proving things, get an arbitrary element of A. So let x be in A. We want to show that it is in B. What does it mean for x to be in A? It means that x squared minus 1 is equal to 0. We have to show that this arbitrary element of A is either negative 1 or 1. Then we now solve the equation. We have x squared equals 1, which means that x is equal to 1 or negative 1. And so, what does it mean if x equals 1 or x is in negative 1? It means that in both cases, x is an element of B. So thus, we have just shown that A is a subset of B. By combining these two parts for our conclusion, therefore, we have just shown that A must be equal to B.